As a massive lover of everything fantasy, there is nothing more terrifying than the news that a fantasy book or series is being adapted for television, especially when it's your favourite because of how notoriously bad the industry is at doing fantasy adaptations well. Now when the announcements come through, I just roll my eyes and don't even bother getting my hopes up because of how many projects are just thrown away by production companies who buy the rights and then just sit on them for years and do absolutely nothing. That being said, when they announced that Shadow and Bone was getting its own Netflix series, it was a completely different story. I was beyond excited for this show because A, Lee Bardugo was going to be heavily involved in it and B, the showrunner was a massive fan of Six of Crows. He actually refused to do Shadow and Bone on its own so they had to go and acquire the rights for both series before he was on board. So the passion was there, the characters were there, the cast was spot on and of course Shadow and Bone season 1 ended up being a huge success. So what happened in season 2? My name is Ella and today I'm doing a deep dive into why Shadow and Bone was cancelled, sharing my opinions on season 2 and why I think Netflix ultimately set up the show to fail. There will be spoilers for the entire Grishverse series including King of Scars and Rule of Wolves in this video so just keep that in mind. My credentials, I love the Grishverse it was one of the first books that got me back into reading after high school and I've read the books a billion times over for pleasure and also completely picked them apart for this video so I have a lot of things to say. First and foremost I want to make it very clear that this video is attacking Netflix. It is not attacking the writers, it is not attacking the cast or Leigh Bardugo herself, it is Netflix who screwed this up. Everyone behind this show is fighting so hard alongside the fanbase to get Shadow and Bone renewed and it's so refreshing and heartening to see a cast and crew who really care about the project and the story itself. So while I will be critical of writing choices in season two, I strongly believe that the writers did the absolute best they could with what Netflix gave them, which wasn't much. Let me elaborate. So Shadow and Bone was one of the many shows that was cancelled by Netflix about a week after the Hollywood actors and writers who were on strike reached an agreement. The strike reportedly cost Netflix millions, so they axed the show to cut costs. That's the official story, and it's no secret that Shadow and Bone is obviously an expensive show, what with all the VFX work that goes into fantasy shows. But by Netflix standards, this show was doing well. Season two had just under 193 million hours viewed from its release in March up until June of 2023. Despite some media articles trying to claim that it never went number one, it did. It was the Rotten Tomatoes fan favourite show. It had genuinely positive reviews that were pretty consistent with season one. One of the episodes was nominated an Emmy for its visual effects. With the renewal of season two and the showrunner himself speaking about a five season plan, it was clear that Netflix were initially interested in keeping the story alive. They paid for a Six of Crows spin-off script and the writer spent 26 weeks working on it once season two of Shadow and Bone was given the green light. And those writers have been very vocal on social media in letting us know what they think about Netflix's cancellation of their show. What I found was that those writers also don't entirely believe that the cancellation was due to the strike. Writer Christina Strain reposted a tweet calling Netflix miscreants, claiming that they were passing the blame onto the strike for Shadow and Bone's cancellation when really it was a result of bad decisions and poor management. Another writer also expressed on Twitter how she will never get over how this incredible cast was disbanded and robbed. She described that spin-off as lightning in a jar, which will forever haunt me. If you haven't already, have a scroll through their Twitter accounts. There's some threads talking about that Wyland episode and an Inej episode. They were so confident in the script because Six of Crows adapted so well into eight episodes because of how good the book is. So we may never know the true reason that they pulled the plug on everything, but what I will tell you is that season two was not helping anyone's case. The showrunner Eric Heiser described the season as ending up very differently from what they'd originally planned and written for multiple agonizing reasons. So I would love to hear him sit down and talk about his experience with filming the show one day because I have a feeling that it had to do with the back and forth with Netflix. But in the meantime let's go through my experience and my issues with season two. When season two originally came out my sister and I decided that we would watch it together because we watch a lot of shows together, we watch season one together, but we struggled to find time because both of us were really busy. To be honest I was more scared than excited to actually start the series because I was so scared of how far they were going to stray from the books and what that would mean for the overall show. Book adaptations are always going to be different, I know that, and no one is ever going to be truly happy. I think Lee said to treat this as sort of like fan fiction, which is a good idea, because there obviously are going to be omissions, there's obviously going to be things added that make more sense for television. I was intrigued by how they would do that, but I was also stressed because I knew that in the long term the potential for the seasons would be harmed by the choices that they made in season two. And I was right. So the first thing I'm going to address is the addition and role that the crows play in season two. In an ideal world they would have gotten their spin-off between season one and season two because the feeling of disconnect that you can see in this season between the storylines just completely amps up in this season. There's a half-hearted attempt to connect their storylines in the first episode where there's brief mentions of each other or the places that they're going but it's stitched pretty quickly when you realize that Alina and Mal and the crows have absolutely nothing to do with each other. In the first season I thought this was done really nicely. The transitions were a lot smoother. For example when Mal talks about 
at visiting Ketterdam, it makes sense to obviously introduce the city of Ketterdam with the crows. And then when we switch back to Alina's storyline, it's Kaz talking about how he needs a miracle to survive the fold, which of course Alina is just about to do. And then later in the episode, Alexei's crossing of the fold on foot provides an even stronger connection between the two stories. I'm going to talk about how the constant switching and the focus on the crows really hurt the Shadow and Bone storyline in the first half of the season later. So originally when I watched it, I was shocked at how much they were taking from the sequel, Crooked Kingdom, and putting it into season two. Kaz's whole beef with Pekka Rollins and burying his son alive and making him remember Geordie's name, Pekka hiring assassin to kill Inej, which we will talk about later, the fake plague plot. When I first watched it, I thought that the writers were trying to shove as much as they could into the season because they were scared of being cancelled. But when you consider all this alongside their five season outline for the entire show, it actually kind of makes sense. They didn't have any more material that could serve as kind of a prologue for the Ice Court heist. That was obviously going to be its own spin-off and then season three of Shadow and Bone would have focused on King of Scars with Olena doing who knows what. And that last season would have been genuinely book accurate because they all have the common enemy of Jarl Brum. Sorry if I pronounced that right. In theory that sounds amazing but the execution was not exactly that. The issue with bringing Crooked Kingdom forward was that all that happened in the span of four episodes and those moments with Pekka Rollins and Kaz's revenge they just don't hold the same emotional weight as they would have if they'd been built up. And don't get me wrong Freddie Carter is fantastic as Kaz and I really applaud them for being able to show how ruthless and bloody and vengeful he is but if you were unaware of how deep Kaz's hatred for Pekka Rollins goes because at the end of Six of Crows obviously Inej is kidnapped so that adds another layer to his ruthlessness and it makes his feralness and his defeat of Pekka that much more satisfying. I don't think four or five episodes could ever capture the dynamic between those two considering that happens over the course of two books. I strongly believe they could have done this right. I don't think it was smart to put them back into the Shadow and Bone storyline. It completely cheapened the Pekka storyline. Limiting that to the first half of the show so they could run off and find the Neshi Yenya was really sad because it just felt like they were trying to rush through the storyline so they could get them back with the crows and make them relevant again. I didn't mind the Neshi Yenya storyline but I thought it was just so cheap how they started it. It's one of my biggest pet peeves in fantasy when someone comes up with this random idea based on this myth that oh it's never gonna work it could work and then in a single episode it becomes like the only thing that matters like this is what we have to find or we're losing to the villain like wasn't that just a random idea? The flashbacks of Geordie for Kaz I think were done really well because they felt like the same style they were done in the book where they kind of just jump into his consciousness without warning but the focus on Kaz and Pekka's history and that time jump where we just skipped the entire of Six of Crows really hurt the other characters especially Inej and the exploration of her trauma. Tanta Helene is offhandedly mentioned in the first episode by Inej as if it doesn't affect her at all that she's dead. Editing Ella here I'd like to acknowledge the fact that the menagerie and the fact that Inej is owned is mentioned in this scene and is clearly painful for Inej but instead of delving into that part of her character the writers actually make this about strengthening Kaz's motivations to destroy Pekka Rollins which really pisses me off. Inej is deeply impacted by the sight of the menagerie alone in the book so this scene just feels so disrespectful to her character. Now we don't know whether she's actually dead or not I would have liked to believe that they are smarter than that and they wouldn't kill her off but even in the scene where she's being attacked by the taxidermist who wants to put her back in the menagerie there is no real illusion of her trauma apart from the fact that she is visually very distressed as most women would be when they're being attacked. They name dropped little links but then never acknowledged how painful that time in her life actually was. In that scene they were already switching between crows so there really wasn't time for flashbacks but I think they would have been so helpful especially considering the scene with the poison where she's imagining her and Kaz together. That would give that some real emotional weight on Inez's side because we obviously already know that Kaz is really affected by touch but Inez is also working through her romantic feelings for Kaz and physical intimacy so I personally don't think they did her character justice this season. Amir Suman is brutal brilliant but I wish they'd explored that more. In my opinion the dynamics of the crows are completely thrown off with these new timelines. Jesper and Wyland having a one stand was a choice. I actually low-key wasn't mad about it. It sort of made sense with their aged up characters and the rush storylines to give their relationship something to stand on especially since you already have the slow burn of Kaz and Inej but I also really liked how their relationship still had conflict and they still argued and don't get me started on the Inej and Jesper scene that was deleted because that will haunt me for the rest of my days. Nina's introduction to the crows was strange. I think Kaz just offering her the visit to Hellgate in exchange for her services really undermines him as a character. In the books he offers to break Matthias out of prison only when it suits him after months of Nina begging him to do it. That in itself just shows how manipulative and intelligent Kaz is in making everyone solely rely on him, not betray him, and making sure he does not answer to anyone. And I think that's my favourite thing about Six of Crows is the individual dynamics between the different characters and how interesting it is. So while that was disappointing they kind of dug themselves a hole with that by introducing the Nina and Matthias storyline really early. So Nina never had the time to actually meet Kaz and become part of the dregs beforehand. And don't even get me started on Matthias's story. I love him as a character, okay? Don't get me wrong. I love Matthias, but it was just so distanced from the original plot. I just
just don't know why they bothered at times. If I was a non-viewer, I genuinely think I would have skipped Matthias' scenes because of how clunky and out of place they felt. Inej and Kaz's conversation in the church physically hurt because it was written so well that I was so angry that it just wasn't in the right scenario. In the right circumstances, in their own show, it could have been so good. Like the unspoken you, Inej, you is done so well. But anyway, I knew the book accuracy was going out the window because the crows were obviously being shoved into this storyline that they don't belong in, which then in turn made the Shadow and Bone characters just look like a shell of what they actually are. So let's talk about the other half of the show, which follows the books of Siege and Storm and Ruin and Rising. Editing Ella back again. I just want to preface the shadow and bone section by saying that when I was reviewing this I felt bad because a lot of what I was saying kind of just felt like it was a consequence of how shortened the season was and how they couldn't add the things that I wanted them to add. But I did find in an interview that Heiser has said that good adaptations have you feel the same way in seeing the movie or watching the show as you felt when you read the source material. And I don't believe that they achieved that. I don't believe they captured the feeling of the books. But of course, that's an extremely subjective thing. We all experience books and any kind of form of media in very personal ways. One thing that I didn't touch on in this video that I know a lot of people love that a change that they actually made was Alina's age and that she pushes the story forward a lot more than she does in the books, which I agree with. I think it's an, a brilliant change. Okay, back to the video. I believe that season two completely lost the essence of what made these books amazing. And I think that might be a controversial take because I know a lot of people don't like Siege and Storm for the fact that Mal and Alina seem very angsty and arguing the whole time. And it's certainly fine if you don't like that series. I think that Leah Bardugo's writing improves dramatically with every single series that she writes. And there are obviously flaws in those books, but I absolutely hated what they did with the Shadow and Bone storyline in season two. Firstly, I will say that the Jenny and David scenes are just fantastic. I think they were also cast brilliantly and that conversation that was pulled directly from the books where they're talking about how her beauty is her armour. I was absolutely living for Tolia's fight scene in episode 7. Louis Tan is such a legend. I follow him on Instagram. His stunt work is just incredible. So my biggest issue with the Shadow and Bone side of season 2 was that plot and plot alone is focused on. And it was actually the weirdest experience, right? Because I was re-watching this series just writing down all the things that I was so annoyed about. And then I reached the scene where Mal and Alina have their first fight when he like pulls her out of that dream with the Darkling when she's about to stab his hand. And the writers are so self-aware, it's kind of scary. Now, I cannot say this was done intentionally. Mal says, you're barreling through this. Stag, Sea Whip, Firebird, Engagement, Second Army. And I was like, huh? That pretty much sums up my entire issues with that part of the show. The pace of that storyline is just ridiculous because it just flies by and there's absolutely no conflict. There's some really good dialogue and banter between Alina, Nikolai and Mal in Siege and Storm, which sets up a super interesting dynamic between them that just is non-existent in the show. We lose all the tension and the nuance in the relationships that Alina starts to build with the other side characters. Tolia and Tamar are serious victims of this. In the books, Tolia literally slams Mal into the wall because he fell asleep while he was supposed to be protecting Alina. He's so fiercely protective of Alina for his own reasons and that made me really care about him in the books in a way that I just didn't in the show because they took his poetry as his personality and then just left it at that. Alina's relationship to Genya and David in the books is also severed when the Darkling puts the collar on her. There's also the betrayal of Tolia and Tamar when she finds out that they're a part of the Soldat soul and the cult of the Apparat. And there's some really emotionally intense scenes that give us a lot of insight into these characters but also into Alina's perspective on weakness and morals and changing sides. In my opinion Alina's ties to those individual characters are a massive part of Shadow and Bone. Now now, I want to talk about Mal and his romance with Alina because like a lot of people I really loved him in season one but I just didn't like him in season two because he didn't do anything. The romance between him and Alina felt really rushed. That long kiss in the first episode really just put me off them because I knew that we weren't going to get that same conflict that's in the books. They have this soft awkward kiss at the beginning of Siege and Storm which clearly has these simmering undertones. Everyone obviously has different opinions on Mal. I know a lot of people don't like him in the books. Personally I love the angsty parts of Siege and Storm. I love a little bit of toxicity especially when Mal kisses Zoya when Alina is watching. I live for the drama. What can I say? But I do think people misunderstand Mal as a character because while he isn't perfect I I think that he's still the most human part of Siege and Storm. Alina is becoming the leader of the Second Army and considering a royal proposal and getting access to all this power. And the most significant thing that was missing in Mal and Alina's relationship was the back and forth between them about power and greed. Because what is infinite? The universe and the greed of men. In Siege and Storm, Mal is upset that she wants to hunt for a third amplifier and use the second. He doesn't want her conspiring with the Darkling and using his own methods against him. And I think Mal is the grounding perspective. He doesn't restrict Alina, but he forces us as readers to question, you know, how far do you have to go? How, what do you have to become? 
to beat this villain? And is it worth becoming as bad or as evil as he is? And do we still root for Alina as she becomes everything she fears? How much power is too much? And the Mal and Alina fight that I talk about at the start where they're talking about the really, really fast pacing. It's good, but it's not good enough. It kind of just reduces that dynamic to she's on this path to glory and he's falling behind and that's it. In the book, that idea of abomination against abomination pushed by Bagra, who is also very, very reluctant to let her get all this power from the amplifiers at the beginning, that is completely scrapped and there is no conflict whatsoever because instead she says the abomination would be to not see this through till the end. So we don't get any of Bagra and Alina's conflict for the sake of pushing the plot forward at a ridiculous rate. I was also really annoyed in episode seven, she says to Nikolai, I was so driven by power. No, you weren't. That was never established. You were always driven by your need to save Ravka and destroy the fold. There's no real sense of a lust for power from Alina. She kind of just, just like, lol, yeah, let's just try it out. See what happens if I get another amplifier. She does kind of get lost in her power when she fuses the scales to her skin and she's like bursting with light. But then Mal's kiss brings her back and everyone's just just super happy chappy and there's no more conflict. And even later on, we lose the tension of Mal and Alina finding out that Mal has to die because Bagra just like says it to them instead of them discovering it for themselves. I also had a huge issue with the Darkling's presence in season two. He's not nearly as menacing as he is in season one. And I think that's more of a time issue. With the addition of the Crows, the writers just do not have time to explore how twisted the dynamic with Alina is and how gradually it starts to affect her. The Darkling appearing in Alina's dreams in the literal first scene ruins it completely. In the books, Alina's dreams and visions of the Darkling coming to her is a slow transition. He gradually sneaks up on her and you're never really sure whether he's intentionally doing that or it's just in her own head. It's menacing and manipulative and terrifying and it's completely lost in the show because he's just in her dreams in the first episode. He's there coughing and spluttering and with his little shadow baddies behind him. Ben Barnes is such a standout of this show, I will be so sad to never see him as the Darkling again. Another core theme of Shadow and Bone is religion, and that is completely deleted entirely. The apparat only coming back in the last episode is such a loss because he's actually a massive part of Ruin and Rising. It adds another layer of complexity to the story and it's just another situation that Alina has to deal with. There's this quote, there is no greater power than faith and there will be no greater army than one driven by it. Alina challenges this idea constantly. She is always saying faith doesn't protect soldiers, while the apparat pushes that war is the price of change. The apparat and the pilgrim expectations terrify Elena. They craft this story of sainthood and build her up to be this big liberator. And I thought that was a really interesting part of the story, a representation of how important religion is for people and how much hope it can bring them. Because Elena doesn't see it as hope, she sees it as madness and desperation. That's personally a part of the books that I was really interested in because that idea of sainthood continues into the King of Scars duology. There's a singular mention about it in one of the episodes when Nikolai says to Elena that she is hope and she's so much more important than she thinks she is. But a lot of the characters waffle on about hope and what it means to them and to be honest it was pretty weak there was never any moment where someone said something and I was like damn that is deep they obviously had to cut all that because they just did not have enough time I would have been really interested to see what they actually did with the apparat in season three but I guess we'll never know it's obviously just a personal preference that I wanted that plot point to be included but I just thought that there wasn't enough meaningful conflict between characters to keep me really interested but I shouldn't be surprised Ruin and Rising was completely ignored because they were trying to fit three books into eight episodes I also don't like the ending of Ruin and Rising in the book or the show. In the book, I thought Mal should have died because I hate when authors don't have the guts to just kill characters off. They always just find a way to resurrect them. But I will say that Alina deserved every single moment of the peace that she got. In the show, Mal's resurrection was really inconsistent. Alina uses Merzos, whereas in the book, she kills a part of him that is the amplifier. She kills like the Morozova part of him. And I get that that might be easier for audiences to understand. But then when he's talking to Alina about like their future, he says that the part of him that was a tracker is the part of him that died. Which like, yeah, it was in the books, but you just established that that wasn't the reason. There were some other parts of the lore that I was confused about. If anyone actually has an explanation for this, I would love one because there's a part where the Darkling soldiers use Bagra's bones as amplifiers, but I don't really get how that works because obviously with amplifiers, you have to kill the thing yourself. And I understand that Bagra's a living amplifier, but she's dead. So how are they using her bones to amplify? I, I didn't really understand that. So is there a future for Shadow and Bone? As of right now, realistically, I don't think so. Do I want one? Absolutely. But I just don't think it's as simple as that. I think the major element that a lot of fans aren't considering is the cultural impact of Shadow and Bone and Netflix's disproportionate expectations. Fantasy series will never be able to escape being compared to the phenomenon that was Game of Thrones. Everyone is obsessed with trying to find the next Game of Thrones, trying to make the next Game of Thrones, trying to compare everything to that show. But then when their shows don't have this global groundbreaking impact 
in their first few seasons. They don't actually give them the budgets or they take the risks to give them a chance to become something of that scale. But some news that you might not be aware of. Lee Bardugo said on her Instagram broadcast channel that if the fan campaign doesn't work, they'll have to go about acquiring the rights back from Netflix. Because obviously they pay for that script, so they own it, which is disappointing. And going back to talking about the renewal of the show, obviously it's not unheard of for shows to get renewed or other streaming services to pick them up. But I do want to talk about it realistically. There's a lot of people online talking about how Warrior Nun was cancelled and then uncancelled. But when I did some more research into this, I realised that that kind of scenario is not what we want for Shadow and Bone because the showrunner literally isn't even involved with the new projects. They're not even continuing with the seasons that they were doing. They're making a movie or something. He said, only later did I realise that their agenda for making the film was really not going to be similar to what the TV show was. So in other words, Netflix are doing what they want and completely ignoring everything that the previous showrunner set up. What's even more interesting is that he was also setting up a villain arc for his main character in season three, which obviously is similar to Alina, where she performs the cut with a smile on her face. So to put it simply, I don't want whatever ruined version of the Grishaverse has the slimmest chance of coming back to our screens. I think that the show deserved so much more than what it was given, but shit happens. I think we were so lucky to get those seasons in the first place, but we never say things are impossible around here. We say that they are improbable. So I will link the Save Shadow and Bone petition below. Keep making sure that Netflix knows they made the worst decision by cancelling Shadow and Bone. And thank you so much for watching if you've got this far. This is a bit of a different style video that I'm trying out on my channel because I really like watching video essays and commentaries and I had a lot of fun scripting and making this video. So I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video.